I just start by saying that, that I love being the president of SOAS? You're going to have to prize me out of SOAS. Uh, and I suspect that next year might have to be it because uh, I think probably 10 years might be about as much as anyone really ought to spend being in this very wonderful privileged role. And it is a privilege because SOAS is such a spectacularly wonderful place. It is the most diverse university in the world. I mean, that really is the, 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 the fact of the matter. And our students are the most lively, uh, most vivid, most combative, but also the most uh, compassionate uh, of, of student bodies. And I love being involved with them. Now, this, was, uh, this lecture is, has, you know, this is its second year. And last year, I spoke about human rights. And, uh, and this year, I, I, I've moved on to talk about the whole issue of power, but they're not unrelated, because I think in any democracy, um, these issues are very interlinked. So d this lecture, I mean, I, th there was actually a fourth thing. Who runs Britain, the White House, the banks, Rupert Murdoch, or Downing Street? But Downing Street, for some reason, has dropped off. It may, it may say something about, about, uh, about uh, the mindset when we, were, when we were working this out, that somehow that bit disappeared off the edge. Maybe it's, um, it was, it was uh, uh, some sort of uh, minx within the system. But it's really, it really is a lecture about power. It's about who has power in contemporary societies. The history of democracy is the history of power being redistributed. Um, it's about taking power away from kings was the kind of start of a sort of process. It moved on to the taking of, of power away from the classes who thought they were born to rule. And uh, ultimately, we've uh, seen um, uh, democracies um, evolve out of um, revolt against despots and dictators. Uh, the taking away of power from colonizers and occupiers. And the problem that I wanted to really seek to address tonight and to tackle was the problem concerned with contemporary democracies, modern democracies, uh, and the way in which um, power is much more nuanced, much more complex, um, but no less an important thing to examine to understand some of the problems in our contemporary democracy, and I think to understand the crisis that we're currently going through. Britain's recent history highlights the difficulties that there are around modern democracy. And I only have to look at the last period of government in which I've been able to see it at close quarters. We saw how Tony Blair was I think, humiliatingly obeisant to George Bush on neoconservative foreign policy. And then we had um, that extraordinary sort of abject sycophancy of government to Rupert Murdoch. We also had a sort of disregard of, uh, of Tony Blair in government for the cabinet, and we've seen it in this recent, these recent hearings um, around the issue of the war. The disdain for Parliament, where Parliament has had its power greatly reduced, not just by this government. The preceding government had uh, a hand in all of that too, but we've been seeing uh, a, a decline of the power of Parliament. We've seen also a sort of dismissiveness of Prime Minister's own political parties started off in the days of Thatcher, but it's really been climaxing more recently with the marginalising of the political party. We've seen the sort of craven uh, fealty to the bankers, to the rich, to the very well-off political opportunists who tend to people the courts of Prime Ministers. We've seen a surrender of policy-making often to the editors of tabloid newspapers, particularly on law and order and on immigration and asylum. We've seen a dependency on public relations maestros and spin meisters and polling gurus to find new initiatives that could catch the headlines. But although we could parcel this up and make it an attack on Tony Blair, it really is 
only fair to say that he is, I think, a product of this age. Locating the purveyors of power and influence in contemporary Britain, or probably in any modern democracy, could keep us all entertained well into the night, and I know that you haven't got the time. But there are real issues which people often raise, which are about national sovereignty, about the extent to which any nation is a power unto itself, because the notion of national sovereignty is more and more um, mythical. Any real map of political power in a modern democracy has to include, as we've just seen with the recent uh, recession, the, the uh, credit crunch, the power of bankers, the power of money markets, the power of international corporations. And then, of course, we also have the power of supranational bodies, the United Nations, the World Bank, the WTO. We have clearly to see that power in a global economy is diffuse. National sovereignty has been reduced sometimes to positive ends in order to create communities of mutual interest beyond borders, either joining economic blocks like we have done with the EEC and which other economic blocks do around the world, or signing up to international treaties, much of which I'm very supportive of, on nuclear proliferation, environmental issues, human rights, torture, the, statute on, the statutes on uh, um, uh, refugees, um, the, the consensus on money laundering. All of this involves um, uh, a certain amount of inhibition on our national, national ability to act without constraint. And for the most part, those treaties are to good ends. Signing up to international conventions on human rights has brought, however, with it, a concomitant increase in the power of the judiciary because it means that in order to, to uh, restrain actions of governments, we expect the judges, either in international courts or at our own Supreme Court levels, to restrain the power of politicians when they may abuse those standards that we have set for ourselves by signing up to international treaties. And of course that means that you end up having the, power, the politicians in a clash of power with the judges when you have a running up together of their respective roles. This has happened in Britain recently, as we've seen, around the issue of who strikes the balance between security and liberty. Our judges, as you all know, ruled not very long ago against the government's introduction of detention without trial for non-citizens suspected of terrorism. Our judges also ruled against the acceptance of evidence from other countries which may be based on torture, which may have been the product of torture, Newspapers today and yesterday, you saw um, uh, the, the, the suggestion of serious collusion and, uh, and uh, 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 if you like, a, a co-option and, and a use of material um, produced by torture in other places. In both instances, our judges have invoked international human rights standards in their reasoning and have been profoundly critical of governments. And, of course, the governments don't like it. Power is moving into different places. And the questions raised by all of this that I'm describing are about how can we make such power transparent and accountable? If power is being exercised by big companies, if power is being exercised um, by um, uh, the security services, if power is being exercised, how can we make sure it's being exercised in ways that we would find acceptable? Experience has taught us a number of important lessons about power, particularly political power. In the words of Lord Acton, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think it's now more subtle and I always say it's power is delightful and absolute power is absolutely delightful. <laughs> power has to be controlled. It was this truth that led to the creation of the rule of law. No person, however powerful, even the king, could be above the law. It all started with Magna Carta. And this has, over the uh, centuries since, this has been translated into a near universal contemporary acknowledgement 
that prime ministers, presidents, ministers of state, and all the employees of the state, policemen, immigration officers, prison officers, all wielders of power are subject to law and human rights standards. We've enriched the idea of the, of the, of the rule of law uh, today to mean an inclusion of human rights standards. And that's why when China says, you know, we also abide by the rule of law, we pass laws and everybody has to abide by them, um, it's not quite what we have in mind here because we have said human rights and respect for human rights has to be part of that. The potential for corruption in states takes much subtler form when you're dealing with a mature democracy like the United Kingdom. In fact, we avoid calling it corruption, but it is behavior which is embarked upon with a, an insouciance, uh, which leaves the public with a very bad taste in their mouths. We've had it with the recent exposure of members of parliament fiddling their expenses, and now there are being prosecutions of some of them, but many of them not being prosecuted, but still where one senses that some standards of ethics that we would have expected of politicians has been failed. None of it is large-scale corruption, as we would think of it, and as part happens in many other parts of the world. But to a public facing the recession and pulling in their own belts, there's something profoundly distressing about the idea that people are using their tax pounds in abusive ways. Polling suggests that only 15% of the public trust their politicians. Even journalists... Even journalists are now above politicians in the popularity polls. Lawyers, we're just marginally about the same place, I think, as politicians. But the public in Britain are also suspicious of other aspects of, if you like, this kind of softish uh, corruption. The suspicious of ministers and senior advisors leaving office and very quickly taking up jobs in businesses linked to the very departments in which they worked and related to policies. It's all related to policies of privatisation. And so, and, and let me assure you, it's happened not just in this government, but in pr the previous government uh, of John Major and of Margaret Thatcher, that, that can be, it was well documented, of people moving into companies um, where they, at one stage, were on one side of the table and now they're on the other side of the table acting for the very people um, they got to know in their previous job. None of this is new, of course. The privatisation of public utilities during the Thatcher years led to very similar questionable directorships and consultancies of former politicians and their advisers. And it's a soft corruption in the scheme of things, but it's probably part of uh, every political system around the world, I'm sure, um, and it goes beyond personal gain. Because the sort of corruption I'm talking about involves the fudging of statistics, the failing to tell the truth about uh, uh, material you're using to persuade uh, the public of uh, a particular position. We saw it just now in the whole business of crime statistics being used this time by the Conservatives, but it's done uh, um, across the political board. The cherry-picking of research to support sometimes quite flaky contentions. It means, of course, and we've had it now, uh, and this is my view, but the manufacturing of, of that dodgy dossier on intelligence has happened in the run-up to the Iraq war. It's about a lowering of standards, in my view, which makes people feel very unhappy with, with the political system. It creates high levels of distrust. It means, as well, that we have these public consultation exercises which are purely cosmetic and where the outcomes have actually been decided in advance. And the public know it. They smell a rat. They always do. And, uh, and complain of the way in which um, this is done. At the last election, more people abstained than voted for the government. The total turnout at general elections now hovers at around 60%. 34% of voters at the last election voted Labour, and yet this still gave the government a huge majority of 60 seats. And I sometimes have a pie chart which I show uh, to people when I'm um, giving a talk. 
about how it pans out in our first-past-the-post system, that in fact you can end up having very few people actually voting, end up with a huge majority, um, and yet at the same time, if you were to do a head count, the distribution of votes would be very different. Um, and so you, you understand why it is that the Liberal Democrats complain so uh, uh, vocally about the unfairness of the system, where they end up with uh, uh, so few seats, but in fact, on a head count, many more of the population voted for them. What's interesting is that the landslide of 1997, huge landslide, 120 uh, uh, majority to Tony Blair. But what was interesting was it was on a smaller vote than that which secured the previous very marginal victory of John Major in 1992. More people actually voted and went out, significantly more, um, than had voted in 97. But actually, uh, Major only won, you'll remember, by six seats and had to rely upon the Northern Ireland uh, um, unionists in order to get legislation through his parliament. Of all the young women who are currently voting, eligible to vote, some people call this the high heel vote, only 33% of young women vote. In fact, only 39% of young people under 24 uh, bother to vote at all. And what is especially alarming about all this is that the old comforter that, well, people only will start voting once they have to pay tax themselves or once they have their own children and they become solid uh, citizens isn't actually any longer true. The habits of democracy, if they're not embedded um, early on, seem not to become embedded at all. And people in their 30s are now abstaining in increasing numbers. It's increasingly the old, I'll include myself in this, who vote. Twice as many people over 75 vote as under, 20, as, as under 24. The voting electorate is old. Membership of parties is hemorrhaging. 50 years ago, one in 11 people belonged to a political party. It's, it's, it's difficult to get statistics now because none of the parties want to be very uh, clear about what the position is. But at the last count, which was um, in, earlier in the 2000s, it was about 2004, only one in 88 belonged to a political party. It's now thought to be something like one in every 120. Um, now, maybe, I, I always believe that Oscar Wilde uh, had it on the head when he said, um, who wants to be a socialist? It means giving up too many evenings. And, um, and, uh, and I, think, I, think, I, think, uh, I think it's probably true that people feel that about any political party. You know, who wants to have to give up all those evenings? And particularly, who would want to give up all those evenings if you're not listened to? And I'll turn to that in a minute. But actually, what's interesting is more people belong to the National Trust and belong to all of the political parties put together, and more people belong to the Royal Society for the protect Protection of Birds <laughs> than belong to all the political parties put together. So contrary to what we're told by politicians and political insiders, it's not because of apathy or affluence or contentment. I recently chaired, it was back in, uh, after the 2005 election, the Tr Rumtree Trust asked me to chair a thing called the Power Inquiry. And it was to look at why democracy, our democracy was, uh, was, was uh, sort of in decline. Why were people not voting? Why were people not joining political parties? And it was very interesting. When we asked politicians, and we would have seminars, we would have events, we'd ask politicians to give evidence, and many of them did, leaders of the parties and so forth, and they would say, people don't vote because they're happy. The electorate out there is very content. We're well off, an affluent society, there's no reason. Um, most people don't see the point, and, um, uh, and that's why they don't do it, is because they're really content. It was before the recession, of course, it's true, and things are probably um, not any different. But the, the, the reason that was given was um, a sort of contentment. Um, sometimes the argument was given that it was about ignorance, that people were, didn't know enough now about their democracy. Um, but what, what happened when we spoke to people 
as we travelled the country, and it wasn't invited audiences. When you, I know this from other work that I've done on, on commissions. When you put an advert in the paper and invite people to come to a meeting, those who will come, on the whole, are interested in the subject. So what we deliberately did on this commission was that we would turn up at residence associations when they were having their ordinary monthly or half-yearly meeting. We turned up at community centres. We turned up at sports uh, venues. We turned up at um, uh, uh, local... Um, colleges. Um, we went to all sorts of venues, not saying, come to a meeting. But we would add our, ourselves to the agenda and say, did you vote at the last election? Why didn't you vote? What, what do you think of our politicians? What do you think about the system? And every one of the, of the, of the, of the groupings that we approached, we he kept hearing the same thing that came through. People said, I didn't vote or I don't belong to a political party because I don't believe it makes a difference. I don't think my voice is heard. And it's not that they're not interested in politics. And it's not that people are not socially concerned, because they are. They're just completely alienated from political institutions and from formal democracy. Now, these pro problems of low turnout and failing political parties are a feature common to all Western democracies, irrespective of voting systems and, I mean, whether... I mean, proportional representation uh, does seem to make some difference in places, and certainly um, uh, you, can, you get a sort of better sense of people's engagement than you do with the first-past-the-post system, but it doesn't on the whole deal with some of the aspects of, of, of criticism that we get um, here in Britain. Um, it doesn't matter even if people have frequent referendums. You know, people think sometimes that having referendums all the time would, would cure everything. That doesn't seem to make a difference either. Um, and it also doesn't matter whether you have a centralised or a federal system. So there's a, a reduction in voting turnout in most mature democracies. Now, it's interesting that the last election in the United States saw a change in that. Um, people felt they were voting for real change. Whether it would, what will happen um, uh, if uh, when Obama goes to the, to the polls after his four-year term will be very interesting to see. But people were, there was an upsurge, and of course young people who'd never voted before and who might not have voted at all, voted because they believed they were voting for some radical change. And they certainly got it in that there was the first, first black president. But there was an upsurge in voting, particularly by the young and by the black community. The crisis in American democracy now, of course, is around something else, and, and I hope that in questions we might be able to talk about the way in which certain issues can engage people and in quite populist and, and problematic ways. But what people are seeing in the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party is perceived by many um, white people in America as being the Brown Party, a party that represents now black people, that is, represents Latinos, and that it has less interest in the white working class. And... Um, uh, there are fears, even there, that um, many of the southern right-wing Democrats are losing their hold over the populaces that used to vote for them. So there are shifts taking pl place there which point to something that I want to talk about, which is that basically our societies are changing. Our societies are changing, and the people within our societies are changing. We have much more diver diverse societies. We have citizens who are better educated. We also have citizens who, in, in many ways, are more demanding and much more consumers. And so, therefore, what they want from democracy is different. Now, our modern system of representative democracy dates back to the 19th century. And it is seriously creaking. Representative democracy depends on political parties. Mass political parties were invented as a direct result of extending the franchise. As the its franchise was extending, then so we saw the enrichment of the party system, system. Mass political parties were, of course, partly about a way of aggregating the concerns of particular groupings within society. And you only have to look to the Labour Party for that, which was aggregating the concerns of working people um, and who felt that they were not well represented by people whose interests might be very different from theirs. The public needed parties so that their individual voices took on more volume. That by being part of a, a bigger collection of people, their voice, their claims, their desires, their, their vision of the better life took on more volume. And of course, 
in protecting the interests of the landed classes, the moneyed classes, there, there were, it too had its party. And though parties individually sought to bring collective influence to bear on political policy, um, of course, there, there was always leadership and there were always issues around leadership, but the political parties in an industrialised age were largely configured around class, which made allegiances to part, party strongly tribal. Attachment to a party was retained by people for most of their lives and rarely changed. Even when their circumstances changed a bit, they remained very loyal to their, their party. And what has happened is that society has profoundly changed and people have changed. The vision of the good life that my mother and father sought when I was growing up in the 50s, members of the Labour Party, was that the, there was a, theirs was a desire to have a home that had hot water and had a bathroom. They wanted to have education for their children. They wanted to have a steady income. Um, uh, my father, as part of uh, the trade union movement, was anxious to, to make sure that there was some sort of security around his job and that you couldn't just be fired tomorrow and put onto uh, the, the, the door. Many of these, these basic hopes have been fulfilled uh, for most people. Though we must not imagine that poverty has gone. The divide between rich and poor, as you know, is growing, and all the evidence is that, in fact, um, has grown over the last uh, uh, 12, 15 years. But now a combining vision of the good life or the good society is much harder to summon up. The vision thing is a problem because it's become much tougher for parties to imagine the good life in a way that will satisfy the many different ideas of the good life that individual people have within our society. Because those ideas are as individual and atomized as the people themselves. Politics had to change to accommodate changed lives and changed dreams. And one of the great shifts has been in the relationship between citizens and the state. People are clearly more conscious of themselves as rights-bearing citizens. And the growth of consumerism means that people are in perpetual demand of faster and more efficient services, public services. And the desire to introduce market disciplines and private sector dy dynamism into the public sec sector has produced some very strange consequences. One of the things that has happened, of course, has been quangos, the creation of quangos and independent policy commissions, all of it favoured over uh, government doing certain kinds of things, which isn't to say that government hasn't become highly centralised, it has, but creation of more and more quangos. And although it's now the promise of conservatives um, uh, making their bid for government, um, quangos started their lives back in um, the, the years of... Uh, of uh, conservative in government uh, under Margaret Thatcher. That proliferation started then, but great proliferation during the, um, the Blair years. And one of the things about the creation of uh, these independent, um, supposedly quasi-independent bodies at arm's length from government was a way of somehow depoliticizing decision-making in favor of supposedly neutral standards of economic and managerial efficiency. And it was always it was about this idea of taking politics out of politics. And what it does, of course, is that it creates problems around accountability. And democracy depends on accountability. Yet there is a chasm here between independence and depoliticization. I just want to explain what I mean by that. First, the public see that supposedly independent bodies are made to operate in frameworks which are set so tightly by ministers that the delivery of a favourable outcome is a, a foregone conclusion. So you set up your independent commission, but you make sure that either it's run by people who are hand-picked to run them in a way that will be favourable to government, or um, one of the things that's also done is that you make the remit of that commission such that it can only ever be favourable to, um, to, to government. I mean, we saw it, for example, we've seen it around the Hutton inquiry and the, the, the war inquiries that took place um, up until Chilcot, and we'll see whether Chilcot delivers. But 
give, making a remit, making it so that, so that you can uh, attempt to um, uh, uh, produce outcomes that are, are, fore are foregone conclusions. But secondly, while politicians and business lobbies may seek to insulate issues from public debate and engagement, the public rarely accepts that an, an issue is no longer political. And that happens, for example, with the closing down of a hospital, for example. They know that the politics cannot be taken out of politics. The public know that, but politicians keep trying to do it. And so what happens then is that the public see that what politicians are doing is that they're trying to pass the buck to someone else or to somewhere else to make it so that the accountability that was part and parcel of representative democracy is no longer there. And it's why you very rarely see um, the resignation now of secretaries of state or ministers because of some feeling thing within their remit. It's a much rarer thing nowadays. And the public know that. They know that there's a way in which people are um, layering themselves against that possibility. But the other thing that's happening for the public, and they talk about this, is, is how complex everything seems, so that they, it's almost disorientating. That there are so many decision-making hierarchies and convolutions of relationships and partnerships and strategic partnerships power and accessing and seeing where political power lies becomes impenetrable. Nobody appears to be able to answer the simple question, who's in charge? Where does the buck stop? Who resigns when something goes belly up? And the answer usually is no one. And while we the citizens are being lectured about rights and responsibilities, responsibility more often than not is shifted away from politicians. And the result is that citizens' confidence is further eroded. And when I travel to other places, I hear this described in other democracies too. It's something that's being learned. The parties, of course, the political parties, are trying to reinvent themselves. Changed electorate, let's change the way we do business. But they change not always in ways that are successful, and again, the public aren't fooled. One of the great shifts and it's what I think is at the heart of the crisis in democracy. One of the great shifts is in communication. What has happened, of course, is it means is that because of the way in which telecommunications now operate, the way in which communication is so much more immediate, it means that most ways of doing business have changed. But it actually drives us towards presidential styles of uh, of democracy. It drives us also towards presidential styles of campaigning. And if you are someone who can't cut it with the media, can't, isn't photogenic, can't do the business on the uh, you know, Richard and Judy show, then you're in trouble. New technology has changed entirely the way of doing politics. And those were arts which we, we very much borrowed from the corporate world, like marketing direct polling, focus groups, all of which were used by big business. And combining that with the new technologies of television and call centers and the internet and emailing, it's challenged the need for the mass party that was created in the 19th century. And if the mass party is about accessing huge numbers of voters and providing a channel for political interests, a channel from the people up to uh, the politicians and from the politicians down towards communities and so on, well, the new technologies start creating a shortcut. And so political leaders, and particularly those who are good at it, like Tony Blair, could speak to the people across the heads of their party. And they can do it on breakfast television. They can do it with Andrew Marr. If parties were in the business of competing for the votes of individuals, how was it different from competing for uh, sales, as retailers would do, competing for consumers. The commodity may be different, but how different was the selling of a politician or a party from the selling of soap powder? And the concept of the citizen became very confused and has become very confused with the concept of the consumer. And it has very serious consequences for our polity. The destabilizing of our democracy is rooted in a number of social changes related to, as I've said, better educated people who are less deferential, despite uh, the fact that um, our politicians were able to create a culture of deference in the commons, which meant that the people in the offices signed off all their um, allowances. 
by and large, people in the public are much less deferential than they were in the past. They don't think we've got to bow to our, you know, those people who know how to run the country. They're much more questioning of professionals. They do not feel uh, prepared to just leave decision-making to their betters. Um, and we've also seen uh, developments, real developments, which have uh, begun in the business world, moving into all of this. And uh, I've mentioned it already, but we've seen a new style of party leader um, emerging. And a lot of that started in the early Thatcher years. Um, Lord Bell, um, who was Tim Bell, um, who was the, the, one of the great marketing men, tells a very engaging story about how he was brought in to give advice to the Iron Lady before, um, when she was running first for office, and that she was highly skeptical, skeptical of anything that he could offer her. And then he went off to the drawing boards, and then um, eventually the Satchi boys came up with that famous poster, Labour is not working. And remember the queues of people on, on, on the dole and, uh, and this depressing vision of, of Britain of the time. And, uh, and then she was quite turned on to the possibilities of how marketing could work. Now party leaders of all political hues want the best advertising uh, uh, folk um, at their elbow. And, um, and what we then see is a sort of marginalising of that cumbersome business of having to engage with party activists, uh, talking to, you know, dealing with party conferences where policy is formulated. We don't have to do that anymore. What the political class realized is that nowadays you can cut the party out. You don't even need an act of local party for canvassing when you can employ a call center to chivvy voters. And that's what the political parties are now doing. You get a large donor to give you the money and they foot the bill for a call center to call you. And you can only test it by, by actually asking questions back to the person. If you ask a complicated, you know, ask a kind of little nitty-gritty question back to the person, and they're looking at a board in front of them, and, um, and like the poor person working in India who's having to answer uh, questions you might ask about your phone service or your, your uh, credit card, you'll suddenly find that the person at the end of the phone doesn't know very much, actually, about um, um, the particular political party. We learned a rather ghastly new way of doing politics from the United States. We learned the very damaging lessons of triangulation. Di triangulation is democracy by mathematical formula. The formulation identified by the pollsters is that elections are won in marginal seats or in swing states in the United States. Constituencies with an established history of going one way and this is one of the problems of the first-past-the-post system, is that if, if, if a constituency always goes to Labour or always goes to uh, the Conservatives or occasionally to the Liberal Democrats, those safe seats basically can be taken for granted. And all the effort is then centred around the seats which are capable of shifting. And then through fo focus groups and polling, you ask voters in the marginals what would make you vote for the other guy. And then they steal the other guy's clothes. And that colonizing of the other party's policies is the secret of triangulation. But what it means is, and we're seeing it just now because both parties are having to look at each other's policies to see where the edge might be won. Who's going to be more tough on crime and law and order? Who is going to be more uh, um, uh, committed in their relationship to the United States and their support for whatever the United States is doing in Afghanistan? Who is going to be, um, and each party is looking to the other to see whether any edge can be won by going in a particular direction. And that colonizing of each other's policies, that secret of triangulation, actually hollows out democracy. Because it means politics without principle. It means politics without a belief system. And it does, the problem is it wins elections in a first-past-the-post system even if it drives down turnout. And it's very easy politicking. And as I say, all, all of our political parties are now playing it. The strategy works in the short term, but it destroys politics in the long term. Because what happens is that both parties are bound to offer pretty much the same policies. Despite the commitment to the mantra of consumer choice, there is very little choice being left in politics.
And so instead of moving from a one-party you know, uh, state, which we actually in some ways had during the Thatcher years of 18 years of one party in power, you then move to the one-doctrine state in which you have different parties, but they all are actually uh, uh, offering pretty much the same thing, and it becomes about whose face you prefer. Uh, who looks nicer? Are we sick of the crowd that have been around for too long? Shall we just have another set of faces? Now, the press can make or break a leader's chances. Rupert Murdoch had, has to be courted. And he has to be courted for fear of headlines in the run-up to the election. And in uh, 1992, we all remember that the Sun newspaper carried that big front page which said, um, the last person left in Britain, turn out the lights if Labour wins. And, uh, and the next day, the Sun newspaper, said, newspaper triumphantly said, it's the Sun what won it because they were so convinced that they had actually made the difference. Now, who knows whether they made the difference or not, um, but certainly um, the political parties think it matters. And so Rupert Murdoch is courted um, uh, and gets to decide whether there's a referendum, for example, on the proposed European Convention. Do you remember when we were having a European Convention, um, a Constitution, sorry, a European Constitution was going to be uh, created, and so the question was, uh, um, you know, the call was being demanded from parts of our political firmament. We want a referendum. And Blair said, no way. Then Murdoch says he wants a, uh, a referendum, and Blair caved in. It didn't come to it because, as it turned out, other nations voted against the European Constitution. But it was interesting to see where power lay. The press becomes the official opposition when, despite low turnout, elections are won by landslides because then you get a very powerful government that can force anything through, through parliament and it has a, 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 a compliant parliament because it has lots and lots of, uh, of its own MPs and so the government can get anything done. And so the people who then say we have to be in opposition because the opposition in parliament isn't worth a candle become the press and they start taking on that role. They become the official opposition. And um, we've got to remember that with, when you have government with big um, majorities, even although it's a low turnout, you get incredible things. I mean, for example, all that Parliament seems to do is pass legislation, and I can tell you that as someone who's in there. We've had 56 government bills in a year. We, I mean, you can't action, that's like really only eight, eight months. You can't scrutinise bills when you're making them in that sort of number. We had, from 1997, when Labour came into government, we've had 3,000 new criminal offences created. 3,000. I mean, the courts can't keep up with it. The judges are tearing their hair out. It's a good job that they've got wigs to wear. To, you know. <laughs> but but, but it, there really is an issue around all of this. And it's about legislating to show that you're doing something, and often when legislation is unnecessary. How do they get it all through and through Parliament so quickly? Well, the government payroll is now the largest it has ever been. What do I mean by that? It means that the people inside, in this occasion we're talking about the Labour Party, inside the Labour government, the people who are actually on the payroll who've got jobs. And we now have in every department, and more and more departments created, more and more government departments, and inside those government departments you'll have six people with ministerial titles. You know, lower ministers, junior ministers, upper ministers, down ministers, you know. And they create all of that because once you're on the payroll, there's no way that you can vote against your this collective uh, responsibility. You can't vote or you're going to lose your job. You'll have to resign. And that supplements your income. And it gets you a car. And it gets you all kinds of good stuff. So you're not going to mess around with that. And so you can end up, you end up only having... A, a comparatively small section of, your, of the, the party that's won, Labour in government, only a small number of people actually haven't got a job. And usually they're the ones who are being punished for having rebelled against the government in a vote, because that's what the whips do. The whips have incredible power, which says, you want a minister to come and help you win the next election? I'm not going to let anybody go down and, and, and uh, stand on your hustings when you're uh, up for re-election. You want to go on those nice trips to here, there and yonder that we send parliamentarians on? You're not going to get on any of them. You want to go on a select committee? No way. 
and the whips can actually control people's whole career. So the government payroll, now the largest that I've said that it's ever been, um, guarantees votes for government. So even with rebellion, government can always get its business through. So no wonder the media sets itself up to hold government to account because nobody else seems able to do so. Occasionally, we in the House of Lords can put a block on something, but um, uh, it's an extraordinary business when it's the unelected House that ends up doing that. So what, of course, then the media also does is it, is it, um, it, it introduces a whole business of the cult of personality, and it seeks to do its business of opposing, often by annihil annihilating um, the character of the people who are in that political world. The search for scandal replaces analysis, an exhaustive and exhausting preoccupation with the sex lives of ministers, the bad fashion sense of their wives, the kind of drug habits of their children, and so on. And the press spend so much of their time pursuing this. And so we get a press that in some ways is the product of, of a failing democracy. Now, I've mentioned that the effect of triangulation is to hollow up hollow out our democracy and, uh, um, and to have an impact on the, qu the quality of the party's offer. We, there's a great serenading of the idea that politics has, is no longer about ideology. People seem to think that's a good thing. They seem to have, think that we've got now a, a, a delicious postmodern form of, uh, of, uh, of democracy, which is, I suppose, like the post modern novel that doesn't have a storyline or the postmodern film where the end is the beginning and the beginning somehow is somewhere further down the narrative. And so in the same way, we've, we're trying to sort of depoliticize democracy. And some sustenance for this idea of non-ideological politics um, came from Fukuyama, who was a, an American theorist who put forward the idea that after the end of the Cold War, the great collision of ideologies of, of communism versus uh, uh, capitalism was that it was the end of history. That we didn't, that, that there, were, there was to be no great struggle of ideas anymore. It wasn't necessary. Liberal democracy had won. Well, tell that to the jihadis that I'm now representing in court because uh, um, uh, they uh, would certainly see it differently. But what we then have heard and we've heard it from senior politicians, Jack Straw, uh, uh, as an example, where, where it all becomes part of what was being described as managing Britain PLC, as though our, our, uh, what Britain was was some great corporation, and these guys were strutting on the, around, uh, you know, on the, on, on the, in the boardroom circuit. And Jack Straw spoke of a new era of executive democracy, where the top management team delivers what works. That's what, that's the, the basis for policy was to be what works. But a politics devoid of a vision of the good society, shorn of some sort of over, overarching philosophy, is for me blancmange. It's the, it's like the sort of pre-digested pap that we feed to babies and that somehow is patronizing of a, of a public. It leaves adult citizens with a hole in our guts and somehow a hunger for something more substantial. We know we are being shortchanged, and it drives people away from formal politics and from participation. People question why they should belong to a political party when they have no role in policy formulation. And when political party conferences provide no opportunity, no conduit for being heard because they're so stage managed and present corporate unity in some kind of um, false way. Within the parliamentary parties, iron discipline by the whips is sought. Um, and, uh, and of course, there was all that business, you'll remember, of talking about politicians having to be on message in the early Blair years, where it was absolutely imperative that you carried ar around with you your uh, uh, thing telling you how to vote. I have to tell you that I never, ever went to the office where you had to pick it up. And I suppose maybe that can explain my terrible... Um, um, uh, failures to vote the right way, um, but um, but also that's that we got that whole business of politicians going on the radio and sounding like the radio clock, um, and and talking in that terrible um, rehearsed way. It's not surprising 
that we have, in fact, seen a certain amount of revolt by, by, by MPs, because as they became clear that this was really um, um, so unsatisfactory, we actually saw in incrementally, as it got closer towards, as it's got closer towards now, more and more um, rifts and divisions within um, the party, because you can't hold that down forever. And those same rifts and divisions will inevitably happen in the Conservative Party. When the Conservative Party, I suspect, will win um, its uh, time in office, but if it goes down the road of triangulation, of trying to uh, uh, find a way of selling to the public something that the, most of their party um, are not really content with, you will end up with having a discomfort at the heart of their political uh, uh, followers. And so you end up having the very kind of problems that Labour is now seeing for itself. I want to make it clear that I'm not advocating a return to the politics of old. I don't think um, you go back. Parties do have to reinvent themselves. We do have to take account of the fact that technologies have changed, that, that communication forms have changed, those grainy images that we saw on television back when I was a child, where we had, politicians were very uh, unfamiliar people. Uh, we had you know, very little knowledge of the private lives of people. I don't think I even knew if, uh, if, if Harold Wilson had children. Um, but it was interesting the way in which all of that has changed and will not go back. But the answer to the problems with democracy is more democracy, I think. Despite being the oldest liberal democracy in the world, the UK has never had a democratic revolution. No great rising up of the people demanding the overthrow of, uh, of uh, the established order. And of course, that has meant that we haven't got a written constitution. And, uh, and, and people always, when I speak about uh, um, constitutional law um, in other countries, always ask me about that, and they always think it's very strange. And we pride ourselves in the fact that we have um, had relatively, relatively peaceful transitions from uh, aristocratic oligarchy to liberal democracy along a sort of single yellow brick road um, from Magna Carta down through uh, you know, the Bill of Rights of 1689 until... Um, the almost um, until well until the universal franchise, but it's always worth remembering that at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, I always have to go back to this. It wasn't just my granny who didn't have the vote; my grandfather didn't have the vote because my grandfather was not a property owner, and it was only property owning men who had the vote. Um, and then it was the transition to universal suffrage, which first of all then expanded it um, to include um, uh, uh, men over a certain age and then uh, eventually to women. So our history is one of incremental, complex struggles for democracy and for the rule of law. There hasn't been any great constitutional moment. And it means that we don't have an easy set of symbols in the way that Americans do. And if you speak to classrooms of American children, they can put their hand on their heart and recite to you their Bill of Rights and, uh, and aspects of their constitution. We don't have that. It's much more difficult. But we do have a rich history of why we got to this particular place. People like to say that we have a great flexible system, and it's true, we have got flexibility, but some of the checks and balances, some of the things that were, were checks and balances, relied upon a sort of honour code about people behaving like honourable gentlemen, and somehow that doesn't work anymore, and we have to think about ways in which we might pin some of this down. So I believe that we may be looking at having to recreate, even if we don't create a sort of absolute, detailed, written constitution, that certainly aspects of our constitution should be written and made clear to establish um, a much fairer ground rules for play. We always like to imagine that we in Britain have a sort of DNA within our system that we, the British, you know, somehow believe in liberty and, uh, and fair play and it's all encoded within us, that we were made that way. Well, let me assure you, nobody's ever made that way. They're not national characteristics that just come with being born here. And the way that you produce, those things are produced as national characteristics actually, I believe, come out of many of our experiences as a people. And they exist as a product of our understanding of power. And in Britain, as, as law evolved, 
and I say this as somebody who you know, practices within the courts, as a, common, a lawyer within the common law system, is that at the heart of our system is a scepticism about state power. And we should cherish that scepticism. It's a scepticism which says, why? Why do the police want to have that information? Why does the state want to have that information? Why is it that government wants that or this? And that scepticism about state power is what I think has helped us resist fascism ever taking hold in this country. Because we've never just seen the state as something that is entitled to make demands of us. Now, I know all this much more clearly because of my own battles with, with government over civil liberties issues. Liberty is something that is either sustained or diminished through the way that political systems and institutions manage power. And the collective power that results from people acting in concert is what creates and sustains democratic institutions. And you can't, you see, the whole business of, of individual and individualism is that it's not enough. You have to aggregate and get together in order to keep institu institutions good. And democracies require really good institutions. You have to have an independent judiciary that's not being attacked either by the Daily Mail or by Blunkett in office or whoever is sitting in the home office seat. There's some, something in the drinking water at the home office that does something to people who take up that, oh, that role. Um, you also have to have an independent uh, civil service. And we've seen great erosion of our wonderful independent civil service that was part of, 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 of the British way. Uh, with more and more people bought, brought in because of uh, uh, and, and, and attempts to politicise and attempts to make people their mates um, who are the civil servants who are supposed to be um, uh, impervious to that. Um, you know, is he one of us? And it didn't start just with Labour, it was there before. And it's a post-Second World War thing that we've seen this, these changes taking place. The great sort of liberal consensus after the Second World War around our democracy, has be, is being eroded. And then, of course, you need to have, for good democracy, an independent uh, media. And therefore, it means that you cannot, we cannot allow um, great uh, monopolies to develop, run by any one family owning too much of our, of our uh, media. And we see in Italy the problems over Berlusconi and, uh, and the media um, control that he has there. Many of these different things, a, a, a rich and lively civil society, very important uh, to, to keeping our democracy good and true. Those who have power never in the end want to give it away. Why would they? Nobody's going to vote for their own demise or a reduction in their power. Prime ministers, members of parliament will always only make arguments for the most minimalist of change. And so even just now, when clearly there is the, there is there's a, a, a need for a kind of cleaning out of the of the stables, where we need to look at our uh, our institutions, we need to look at our political system. Um, the, the the what's on offer is very very marginal. An alternative vote here, says Gordon Brown. Uh, a referendum, if we were if he was to return to to to. to which would not really be anything like the proportionate uh, voting system that we really would need to have if we wanted some opening up of, uh, of our politics. The offer of um, uh, some of the changes within Parliament still not good enough to actually really give power back to Parliament so that it can hold the executive to account. A recreation of proper cabinet government and so all of these different things that really need to be done, I happen to be someone who's in agreement with our former um, senior judge, um, Lord Bingham, that we really need to have a constitutional convention to look at the ways in which um, our democracy has to be um, made whole again. So there, there's a whole constellation of forces that create real distrust um, and political disengagement with, within our parliamentary democracy. And the recent crisis financial crisis, has actually, in, in many ways, only made matters worse because the one institution that should have been holding the city to account and so on in those years um, failed to do so because of, uh, of just failing to properly uh, regulate um, and to, to contain that. And it means that um, it's poor people, it's ordinary people, 
who end up paying the cost, taking the risks of that high-risk banking that was going on. Well, we're seeing the passing of the Blair era, and the question is, what's to come? And, uh, and I'm afraid not enough is on offer. And, uh, and what we have to uh, look at is how do you create a, pro a democracy that's right for the 21st century? I think that you have to. It's one of the reasons why we have seen the development of, of human rights. You have to protect ma ma majorities, uh, minorities, because the, the real temptation is that when you move away from um, political parties, and we're seeing them withering on the vine, and if politicians are getting their views by taking soundings from polling and focus groups, then what you end up is with is, is a sort of populism. And with that, often there are scapegoats. There are people in society who end up suffering. And crude populism is, uh, is something that we are going to have to guard against um, in this new form of politicking. I've just come back from Colombia, where the president there is about to, uh, having um, extended his terms as president, uh, is doing an, an another thing of rather like Chavez, rather like Mugabe did, um, is now wanting to extend his term as, as president. It's not anything like as uh, as uh, as um, as, uh, as bad, perhaps, as uh, as uh, as in Zimbabwe, but. When I spoke with people, there was a real concern because one of the things that um, uh, Uribe, the president, does is he's, he's seeing what happens in America and he now has um, town hall meetings. Every week weekend, he's off and he goes to some part of the country and he has a town hall meeting and he says, tell me what you want. Tell me what your problem is. And somebody else put their hand up and say, somebody's you know, encroaching on my land and does such and such. And he'll say, what's your phone number? And he'll say, take his number, sort it out. And people think it's all fantastic. They go straight to the top guy. Um, but the problem, of course, is that there are many people who don't get to those meetings. And you end up also, you have him um, making policy based on the people who turn up. And uh, there's a very real sense of, again, uh, uh, new methods, because he can fly in his little airplane, he's got uh, technology at his disposal, and uh, he's able to speak to the people on television regularly. And so there's a way in which... Uh, he feels that he's in touch with the people, and the people give him their views, but in fact many people's voices are never heard, particularly the most poor. And so, what do we do? Um, we've never had a democratic revolution, but what we have seen are the transfers of power from aristocrats of old to gentlemanly capitalists in the Victorian era, and now we've had a move to the technocratic pol professional politician. Politicians increasingly do not have a hinterland. They do a degree in politics, they decide to work as a researcher for a politician, they go into a, a think tank um, that's uh, working on policy to hand over to the senior uh, leadership of a political party, um, and they're all in their 20s and then decide that they want to become a politician and by their late 20s they're looking for a seat. And those people do not come having been teachers, having been uh, run businesses, having uh, uh, had lives out there um, doing other things. And they become professional politicians. And so it's a career where, as a professional politician, it's very worrying if you lose your seat. And so it means that you'll end up doing almost anything to ensure that you don't lose your seat. But it also means that you'll play a game within politics, um, which is... Uh, which in many ways might not be about serving the interests of the people. And that, again, is a complaint that's made the world over. Now, all I would say to you as I come to the end of this is that absolutely we have problems. We have a globalised world where financial institutions are, can actually bring governments to their knees. The crisis that's taking place now in Greece isn't just about any sort of mismanagement in Greece. It's about the way in which a philosophy they took hold, which was that markets should be deregulated. Markets could deliver everything. And that whole thing fed into the World Bank, the IMF, it was the demands made in countries in Africa and so on. And, of course, in the end, there was a price to pay. The way in which governments conduct themselves are influenced by money markets, influenced by our relationships with other countries like the United States, influenced by so many other things that are nothing to do with what might be in the interests of citizens here in the UK. Now, that's the nature of our world. 
But one of the things that is vital in all of this is to have openness and transparency, because the only way that we can know and think of and evolve ways of in creating new democratic processes is by knowing what's going on. And that's why demanding openness is one of the things that we have to be doing in order to create uh, an effective modern democracy. Now, the public want a voice. They're tired of spin and sleaze. They want honesty in politics. They want politicians who are prepared to say that they've got it wrong when they have got it wrong, that they've made mistakes. Um, the public are actually, I think, nauseated by short-termism. Um, they really do want to uh, um, think about where the country might go for their children and for a, a future generation. And they're certainly sick of all the business of having czars for this, czars for that, um, blue sky thinkers, all those things that were invented um, during the last um, uh, period um, that we've seen. And they're certainly tired of the business of eye-catching initiatives and things that are done really in order to romance with the tabloid media. They want to have politicians of substance. They want to see people going into politics who come from a different kind of background. They want to have variety and variation in those who represent them. But they also want to have opportunities between elections to be heard and to be listened to and genuinely listened to. We, uh, um, I, having chaired the Power Inquiry, only uh, we kept this going and we created a campaign in the run-up to this election. And it was, it's not party political, it's basically saying, what kind of democracy do you want to the people out there? And if you want to, you can go on the internet and you'll see Power 2010, as it's called, is asking for you to vote on certain kinds of changes and a sort of list of possibilities which could change your democracy. And it's for you, the public, to say how those, uh, which of those you prefer and which of those you think could make a difference. And they're about all the things that are sensible. Proportional representation, I happen to think, means that you would have a fairer system of votes, that you actually might think of a better way of funding political parties so that the rich do not have the power over the political parties that they currently have. And we made suggestions in, in the Power Report of actually putting caps on, uh, I mean real caps, on what uh, uh, people can spend and what people can give to political parties so that they don't have um, excessive power. Um, we also, um, uh, we should be looking at ways in which politicians themselves have alternative career routes within par Parliament, that they can sit on select committees which should be empowered to actually do much more about um, examining the conduct of government and the kind of policies that are going through the kind of examination of, of legislation that can't take place inside uh, the House of Commons itself, but ha has to happen you know, sort of parallel to it. And, and questions about, I mean, should it ever be possible for there to be a change of a party leader midterm without there being a requirement that that person goes to uh, election within something like six, six months? Because the, the, it's interesting that when we spoke to the public in recent um, um, public meetings, there was a strong sense that people felt that Gordon Brown should have, within six months, gone to the, gone to the, to, to the electorate and, and got a, a, a sort of legitimacy for his period in office, that we actually should find other new ways of, uh, of making democracy work more effectively. Um, and it might have been better, actually, for him if he had done. But... Um, uh, but uh, but other, the other ways that we can make our democracy better. But more than anything, it has to be about somehow encouraging participation. It has to be about listening to our young, creating spaces for participation, which currently don't exist. And many people from um, ordinary backgrounds who used to get involved in politics because they were in the trade union and it started there so that they represented their group of workers don't have those opportunities in the same way anymore. People who went to workers' education classes don't have those opportunities of getting on their feet and speaking and therefore are intimidated about actually getting up at any kind of public meeting. That people feel that they don't know how the system works. And suddenly when it's explained to them, um, often they see ways in which they could lobby or get the changes that they would like to see. But it's all very opaque. So I just wanted to say to all of you is that we deserve something better, um, and we certainly should recognise that our children deserve something better. And so if we want our democracy in the modern world to be different, then we're going to have to look very carefully at the way in which our society has changed 
And how do we, in response to those changes, create a democracy that's fit for our times? Thank you.